Come all ye young fellas that follow the sea Tell me away, hey, blow the man down And pray pay attention and listen to me Give me some time to blow the man down I'm a deep water sailor just in from Hong Kong Tell me away, hey, blow the man down If you give me some grog, I'll sing you a song Give me some time to blow the man down was on a black collar, I first served me time Anyway, way, hey, blow the man down And on a black collar, I wasted me prime Give me some time to blow the man down Is when a black collar preparing for sea Anyway, way, hey, blow the man down You'd split your sides laughing at the sights you might see Give me some time to blow the man down with the tinkers and tailors, sojourners and all To me way, hey, blow the man down That ship for prime seaman on board a black ball Give me some time to blow the man down Cause when a black baller is clear of the land To me way, hey, blow the man down Our bosun then gives us a word of command Give me some time to blow the man down Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today at Penobscot Marine Museum. Please leave questions and comments below. We love hearing from you. Today we have detailed 19th century prints from three Penobscot Bay towns. The one we're looking at right now is Castine. Joseph L. Stevens Jr. and his friend Fitzhenry Lane often took the steamships up from Gloucester to Castine for a vacation. Joseph told Fitz if he made a print, people would buy it. And here is Fitzhenry Lane's drawing of Castine, printed by Joseph Stevens in 1850. Castine is a beautiful peninsula in Penobscot Bay with some amazing history. We are looking at Castine from the east across the water from Hospital Island. Here is the steeple of the first parish church built in 1790, the oldest meeting house in Eastern Maine and used for town meetings as well as for worship services in the early days. The original bell was cast by Paul Revere and the replacement still there today was made by his son, Joseph. Church is Unitarian Universalist now. Fitzhenry Lane was born in Gloucester. His father was a sailmaker. And from an early age, it was difficult for him to walk. Not being able to afford more formal education, Fitz worked in a print shop. Robert Salmon, who also worked in that same print shop, saw two of his paintings of Liverpool last week. And Robert Salmon was probably a significant influence on Fitzhenry. We've got a number of different vessels, a couple of guys here with a little sloop, and some large ships docked and anchored. We've got a larger schooner here uh, with a top sail, probably a coasting schooner. And over on the left here, we've got a number of little fishing vessels. This one here, you can see it has two masts, but no boom. Uh, so the sails are uh, what's called free-footed. So it's a little bit like a Hampton boat. These are a couple of fishing schooners and we've got a sloop carrying lumber here with a barge type hull. So made for carrying heavy cargo, probably didn't travel very far. The 19th century casting thrived with booming shipbuilding and trading. Casting ships took salted fish down to New Orleans to feed enslaved African-Americans, then took cotton, 
picked and cleaned by the same enslaved people over to Liverpool. Salt from Liverpool went back to Castine to preserve the cod that would get shipped down to New Orleans. Early history of Castine is really intriguing. Penobscot Bay has been a trading hub for native peoples for thousands of years. And in the 17th century, Europeans wanted to get in on that. A uh, trade fort was built on Castine by French traders and missionaries in 1670. Uh, the French had been in Penobscot Bay as early as 1524 with Verrazano's voyage for King Francis I. Champlain and Baron Saint Castine wanted to trade for furs and were a little more willing to work with native peoples than the English who wanted to clear land for farms. French, British, and Dutch vied for territory throughout the 17th century, and British and Dutch attacked the fort at Castine, and Penobscot Bay traded hands many times amongst the three nations. Meanwhile, Native peoples were stuck in the middle of the complex, watching Europeans take their land by hook or by crook. Penobscot Bay continued to be fought over during the Revolutionary War, Captain Henry Mowat was sent by the British to shore up the old French trading fort and take possession of Penobscot Bay. Instead, he went up to higher ground and started building a new fort, Fort George, which you can see on the top of the hill here in this print. Bostonians heard of this and sent 44 vessels to take it back. They laid siege to Castille. Moet was still in the middle of building a fort during this siege, but Castine was well defended by natural obstacles, including a high cliff on one side, roiling contrary currents from the two rivers. So Americans stalled uh, while they were trying to figure out how to get at Castine. Meanwhile, British reinforcements were on the way. Americans lost every vessel, scuttling or burning them to prevent capture. And the troops, uh, including Paul Revere, by the way, walked all the way back home to Boston. After Penobscot Bay was taken by the British, local residents were told to pledge allegiance to the King of England or lose fishing rights. Now, as you can imagine, in any coastal Maine town, that was how these people fed their families. Can you imagine trying to make a difficult decision like that? You will hear later what happened to the folks in Belfast and Bucksport who refused. British retook Penobscot Bay again in the War of 1812. Thank you again so much for joining us here today at Penobscot Marine Museum. Please leave questions and comments below. Next is a print of Bucksport right up the river from Castine, right up the Penobscot River. The people in what was then called Buckstown Plantation were also under British siege after Moat went to Castine. They were completely cut off. No shipping or supplies could get through the British blockade and families started to go hungry. They got a secret message through to people in Massachusetts and managed to smuggle a load of maize corn and ammunition in. When the failed Boston vessels retreated up the Penobscot, many Bucksport families saw the burning ships and wisely fled to their homes. Only a day later, the British came and burned what was left of the newly built town. Undaunted, they returned after the end of the Revolutionary War on the same schooner, Sally, that they came on uh, the first time in 1763 with Jonathan Buck, who was captain and owner of the Sally, and the, that group was from Haverhill, Mass. Interestingly, the first settlement agreement specified Protestant family. And I'm curious, who do you think they were worried would join them in their town that they didn't want? While you think about that, uh, let's look closely at this print. 
across the river from Bucktport is Fort Knox in Prospect. And that's this big fortification that you see here in the print. It was built of large, beautiful blocks of granite between 1844 and 1869. It was named for Henry Knox. We'll come back to him in a few minutes. Why build a fort here? Well, not only were the miseries of being under British military rule remembered for decades after, there were continued fights over the border between Maine and Canada, including the Pork and Beans War, or a rustic war in 1838 to 39. The granite blocks were quarried five miles up the Penobscot River and floated down on barges. The town was renamed Bucksport after the end of the War of 1812, and the town grew rapidly in the 19th century with shipbuilding, fisheries, mills, and the Bucksport and Bangor Railroad, which was uh, built in 1874. I have a little video taken from Fort Knox so you can see what this same area looks like today. I had to remove the sound because it was very windy and there was a loud crackling in the microphone from the wind. We'll give you a little view of Bucksport. We're standing on the ramparts of the fort here. You can see the inner walls of the fort and the round platforms for large artillery. And this is the Penobscot River in front. And that uh, is the Eastern Channel it connects to Orland River. And then it, the Penobscot River continues along here. This is a part of the roof of the fort. Underneath here are big, beautiful uh, rooms made of brick with vaulted arches. The bridge has a beautiful view as well. If you go up into this obelisk here, there's a uh, observation uh, platform and the view is stunning. And I recommend taking a visit here. There are lots of different examples of historic buildings in all of these towns, but this one stood out to me. This is the Buck Memorial Library. The Library Association was formed in 1806, and this building was built in 1887 of Blue Hill Granite by George A. Klopp in the Gothic Revival style. Klopp was born in Blue Hill. His father was a shipbuilder, and Klopp at an early age was already a good craftsman and went to Boston to study architecture. He designed several buildings in Maine and in Boston, including Boston Latin School. This is a print of Belfast in the 19th century. I love this one. There's just beautiful rolling green fields and farmsteads, boats and ships. Samuel Waldo, with money from trading enslaved Africans, bought the Muscongas patent, which covered 36 square miles of land in Maine. When did the Wabanaki sell 36 square miles of land, you ask? Good question. These charters and patents were drawn up by people who lived 3,000 miles away in England who had never seen Maine and never mind made any specific agreements with native peoples. Waldo started encouraging groups of European descended people to settle. Waldo died while surveying the northern reaches of the land and a piece of the patent went to his granddaughter Lucy Fluker. Lucy 
being uh, the daughter of a British court appointed provincial governor of Massachusetts. She had an extensive education and loved to read. She often hung out at Henry Knox's bookstore. Yes, that's the same Henry Knox who would go on to command oxen dragged sleds with cannons through the snowy woods to put them up on Dorchester Heights early one morning, causing the British to evacuate Boston in 76. Lucy's loyalist father wanted her to marry well, but instead she fell in love with Henry Knox. Whether it was Lucy or uh, more likely her cousins, Waldo's descendants sold the plantation of Pasagasawakeg River, that's the river you're looking at in the print here, called today the Passy by local. Uh, the descendants sold the land to 36 Irish and Scots from New Hampshire, who settled in 1770, calling it Belfast, and started trying to make farms out of the forest. Later in life, Lucy and Henry would work together to secure the rest of the patent from her cousins, now named the Waldo patent for her grandfather, and added many more acres as well. So the land that our museum is on was also part of the Waldo patent. The British burned Belfast to the ground in 1779 as well, and the town was abandoned for the rest of the Revolutionary War. The settlers returned after the war only to be attacked by the British again in the War of 1812. Belfast, after that though, quickly became a large shipping and shipbuilding town in the 19th century. When refrigeration became available, Belfast shipped out seafood and later chicken along the Belfast and Moosehead Railroad, which was started in 1871. The railroad bed in Belfast is now a beautiful and accessible walking and biking trail, which I really like to walk on. As usual, we have only just scratched the surface. There's so much more to the history of these towns. I encourage you to explore the town to historical societies who offer fascinating lectures, tours, and exhibits, and we'll post the links below. I want to also mention Roger McGinn's Folk Den Project, which uh, the music that you heard in the very beginning was taken from. He started this project in 1995, posting recordings and sheet music to his favorite songs, including several sea shanties. And I really admire this project's mission to share these old songs. So I'll, I'll put a link uh, after this to that as well as uh, down below, we've got some links to the historical societies. It has been wonderful to be with you here today. Come back next week for uh, the record-breaking clipper ship Red Jacket. Thank you to our members. Thank you to our donors. This programming has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Thank you and take care.